I'm going to speak to you today uh, from the ceded traditional lands of the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs. Um, uh, I'm going to give you some information from an indigenous science view as well as a, a biologist and uh, the science that, that we know. Actually means I am a natural scientist in some Aliyah, my Simshan language. And this is important because this feeds into these ancient connections that I'm going to be talking about. In the Pacific Northwest, we're known as people of the cedar. It's the tree of life. It provides everything for us and has for millennia. The cedar is very important to our identity and to a way of life. We're also known as people of the salmon in the Pacific Northwest. And these two have a relationship, forests, and salmon. And I'm going to give you a little perspective about forests and salmon and how we're studying them also in coordination with First Nations and Indigenous knowledge systems in the Northwest. Theresa, my apologies for jumping in. Uh, Thank you. We still see the presenter's mode if you would like to change to a presentation mode. Oh, I'm sorry. One moment. Don't worry. Take your time. That should be. Did that work? Uh, nope. Okay, let's try. Does that show? No, it's unfortunately still the same. Oh my goodness, okay. Let me see. Start again. So start share. Um, I want to share that one. Now, can you see it? I, if you click that one, let's see what happens then. I still see it in the presenters mode. I can't get out of presenters mode. So, um, I want to share and I want Now we see okay. it in the presentation. Thank mode. you. Fantastic. Oh, thank thank you so much. My apologies. Okay. No, no need. So um, we'll continue from here. This is the relationships between salmon and forest is very, very old, very ancient. And this is what indigenous people are familiar with in the Pacific Northwest. So this is along the, the western coast of North America or the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean. And our indigenous knowledge is, is very important to understanding biodiversity. And we know this around the world. There are several indigenous uh, people around the world, more than 400 million, and it's about 6% of our human population. But they contribute to 80% um, of our remaining biodiversity on the lands that they steward. And so that's all the lands, their traditional lands that are still remaining. We celebrate biodiversity in our cultures. This is a depiction of everything that's used in a Kwakwakiwak culture for food, for ceremony, for celebration. So biodiversity is critically important. And these celebrations that we've had in the past were, um, they were uh, banned in Canada for um, a very long time. And it was a result of not understanding uh, the colonial intersections that Indigenous people um, experienced. And these social institutions that supported us and, and actually carried forward our generational knowledge are still continued their practice today, but they give us more than just our ancient ways of knowing. They're part of showing respect and understanding life obligations and roles. These were taken away in Canada and indigenous children were forced into residential schools. We're still coming to grips with that. The last one closed in 1997 in Canada. So it was a very long period of time of trauma that is experienced by indigenous peoples. 
The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is something that can help facilitate reconciliation and help to better pro provide a better place for exchanging knowledge. And I'll show you some examples. Now, when we think about indigenous knowledge, we think of everything is connected, above ground, below ground, and things that are within each of these areas, in the water, the things that fly, the things that crawl, they're all connected. And that is typical of indigenous cosmologies around the world. In our science knowledge, sometimes we think about uh, a linear perspective. Now, these are just examples to show you how we can um, think about them as maybe uh, the, what is it, the square peg round hole? They don't necessarily fit together all the time. But in between there, we've got these areas of uh, cooperation, exchange, where we can share information and our knowledge. And we see things going on in our salmon forest region, and we're seeing this in other forests as well around the world, where the management is perhaps not seeing the depth of impact. We see right now, this is a Google map of an area in the Okanagan of Southern British Columbia um, known as Douglas Lake. And in, we look at 1984, the forests across the landscape are fairly lush. We look at them in 2018 and we see they're completely devastated. And this has to change because this is where we also see we're losing other values that are associated with these forests, such as bears. And bears rely on healthy forests and salmon that come to them. And this relationship between bears and salmon helps feed our forest as well. And we're studying the way that these nutrients are going into the forest floor and being taken up by trees in the forest. There's, there is evidence that bears are, and sea wolves on the coast of British Columbia are instrumental in distributing salmon carcasses throughout the forest where they will decompose and enter into the soils. The Mother Tree is a project that has started with the work of Professor Suzanne Samard at the University of British Columbia. And it's about understanding above and below ground relationships. These massive trees in the forests of British Columbia are disappearing. And we would like to remain, um, we would like to hold on to the old growth that's remaining at this time, but it's a challenge. So the there was a project that Suzanne started in 2015, funded by uh, an NSERC and, effort and uh, Forest Enhancement Society of BC funding. And it looks at the relationship of forests. Now we're in an indigenous perspective, Subie, the late Bruce Miller, a Skokomish elder, um, used to talk about the tree people. And the interesting thing about this was how the story um, talks about the above ground and below ground connections and particularly the fungi relationships with roots because everything that's connected below ground gives you that strong foundation. And that's what we see in our communities of people as well. Now, when we think about the fungi below ground, of course, we know about mushrooms and that's the flora of the underground mushrooms or underground fungal networks. Mycorrhizae means fungus root, and there are thousands of types of mycorrhizae. We've been studying particularly ectomycorrhizae in Douglas fir forests. This is what it looks like underneath a microscope to look at the hyphae. So when we have done our work, we're looking at how things are exchanged um, below ground, and we're using controlled experiments to look at how things are transferred from one root of, of a plant of a seedling to another root in this picture. We're doing this out in the field too, in the forest. So we have empirical evidence of these um, transfers across mycorrhizal networks. We also have an understanding of two rhizopogon species that were mapped in Douglas fir forests and showing that the connections, the network connections between the large dominant trees were higher in number than they were with the smaller trees. So it shows uh, significant connections among the forest. So these interactions in a forest, when you're looking down on it, are, are occurring all the time. At, 
every moment of the day, these interactions are occurring. There are changes over seasons between species. There are changes between different conditions in the soil with moisture and, and acidity. There are different changes that we're coming to understand from a science perspective. We also did controlled experiments about understanding how seedlings are interacting with the tree from which that seed fell. And there is, an, there is a definite interaction of that tree providing more nutrients and more exchanges with its own seedling than other seedlings. There's still an exchange with other seedlings, but it is interesting to see that it is occurring more with the large dominant tree. The reason for this study is because there was changes in British Columbia, um, there were significant losses of pine, and there's a move to a different forest, which would be the Douglas fir forests. So there's not enough information that's um, been recent with the Douglas fir forest, so that's why we chose these. And we have essentially three main objectives. We set sites, the Mother Trees Project set sites along the climate gradient from Southern BC up to Fort St. James area. And there are eight sites within the interior Douglas fir zone. And we're also looking at legacy trees. What's the regeneration capacity? And so we're using seeds as well, seed sources, both as they are used in present silvicultural practices from nursery stock, and also looking at those species that we know have already started migrating as, as a result of a changed climate. So this is a map to show you that um, climate gradient. And this project looks at, um, we're using a space for time uh, uh, parameter here, because um, this project is going to go into the future as well and to get the time. And when you're talking about trees that live hundreds of years, this project is going to have to continue through hundreds of years of time. But our space that we're looking at here gives us a climate gradient that's very useful to helping us understand how forests work. We have at those eight locations in the interior, five treatments at three different sites. So the first treatment, of course, is the control. The other four treatments you see a depiction of here range from a clear cut and then a 10% retention, which is also known as single tree or perhaps seed tree, and then 30% and 60% retention in the forest. This is what it looks like for each of those treatments. Okay, this is um, uncut control in these forests. And here we have 60% retention. And then here we have 30%. And here we have the 10%. So it's a much different scenario than the clear cut in all of these. And we're making observations as well to changes in carbon in our forests. And this is important when we're thinking about sustainable development goals and we're thinking about climate change and how to mitigate it. So the general photosynthesis formula that people are familiar with, and of course the reverse is respiration, shows us where carbon is, but we're actually sampling the soils and looking at the concentrations in these carbon pools above and below ground. And what we see in the coastal forest is a higher volume of carbon, 600 tons per hectare on the coast, compared to 250 tons in the interior forests. Our coastal site is Malcolm Knapp Forest at the present time, and that's one of our UBC forestry research forests. We're also establishing new sites on the coast. We're in the process of establishing new sites so that we can look at the uh, true coastal variants. And what we see in the difference between Malcolm Knapp here on the left and Vancouver Island on the right, the Vancouver Island being the, the wet, uh, maritime influence we, is a significant difference in carbon. 600 tons per hectare at Malcolm Knapp versus 1300 tons per hectare on Vancouver Island. So we're measuring this above and below ground, as I mentioned. Our control forest gives us a depiction of this graphically when we look at the volume of carbon that's been accumulated since the last glaciation. So when we think about what we're doing now to the forest at a clear cut stage, we know after measuring our clear cut sites that we're losing almost 90% of the carbon immediately just from the clear cut. So then when we think about an 80 year rotation cycle, 
that's that carbon starting to build up, it gets hammered again. And it gets hammered every time there's a rotation cycle, much like we've got changes going on in, in this forest soils that are much like the Dust Bowl of the 1930s in, in, uh, uh, the, down in the US. So this is what it looks like when we have it compared to the previous volume of carbon that was accumulated since the last glaciation, we're losing our sequestration capacity, clearly losing the pools, and we're also losing biodiversity because carbon is supporting that life. Here's a depiction of what the soil profile looks like on the right, where we see these nice, beautiful layers. And what we're finding is that with each iteration of cuts in these forests, those that depth gets more shallow. This is why it's starting to look like we're creating a dust bowl situation. We're getting short, more and more shallow soils um, at each iteration of these clear cuts in the forest. So this is an important uh, depiction of what we need to think about when we're looking at a regenerative forest. We know that we want to have a reconciliation with Indigenous people and First Nations in British Columbia and across Canada and Indigenous people around the world want greater participation in the stewardship of resources that are important to them. The cedar, the salmon, they have relationships that are important to the function of these forests. We want to conserve our old growth. What we have left is such a small amount and it needs to be preserved, but we also understand and want to have economic opportunities and it's there with second growth harvesting. We can do the thinning of those forests and reduce the monoculture so that we can bring back diversity into um, those plantations. We need to have this restoration so that we can increase our biodiversity and increase our carbon sequestration because it makes a difference for the future. We either have the, the forest on the left that's dying or we restore them back to health and something that can be sustainable in our use of these. We're tired of seeing the clear cuts. They're just loading debris on the floor and with a changed climate, the drought conditions that we had here in BC, such as the highest temperature ever recorded in June, 2021 at 49.6 um, Celsius. And the next day having one of the uh, towns Litton burned to the ground is clear evidence that we need to take this seriously right now. There's no time to waste. Restoration is so important on the coast because we need to make sure that these forests remain healthy. If we continue to have periods of drought, then we are going to see ignition by lightning sources and other means perhaps on these forests as well. And they will burn fast when they, are, when they have a stem density that is as high as what we see in plantations. So we know that healthier forests are going to give us um, our biodiversity and it's going to support the many values that we need here on the coast. We have been also observing the uh, movement offshore of, of sticks, I call them, these are, logs are getting smaller and smaller. They're rounds, they're round logs, and they're being shipped offshore. So these are the things that will help change. And as we advance the mother tree in our work, we have all of these things that are interconnected. The mother tree is not a hypothesis. The mother tree is a concept and there are many facets to this in understanding the complex adaptive systems that are our forests. When we're looking at these relationships above and below ground and we see the relationships with the, the fungus roots and mycorrhiza and we see them very similar to the understanding of an indigenous view, it makes sense that we can exchange this knowledge. We know that this, the work that we're doing in the interior Douglas fir is just a start because there are other forests that need to be studied as well. This doesn't necessarily mean the same results are going to be found in forests such as the boreal forest, but the relationships are probably there waiting to be discovered. And it's novel for us to be able to engage this work and indigenous science at the same time and provide something for our future. Thank you very much.